sought the Lord for what to share with you this morning. The Lord laid a thought on my heart, uh, or laid, I shouldn't say a thought, he laid scriptures on my heart. And from these scriptures, I have pulled a thought. And uh, I'll let you know, I had a little trouble with the thought to know how to title this. But God gave that to me early this morning as well. So I will invite you, as it is our tradition here, as we read this uh, opening scriptures to stand with us, please. Um, in reference to the word of God, we'll read Acts chapter 2, verses 36 and verses 37. And then we're going to jump to Acts chapter 19 and read verses 1 through 6. We are people of the word. That's actually what they were called in scripture, people of the word. We believe in the word of God. We build our lives around the word of God. So Acts chapter 2, verses 36 and 37. And then Acts chapter 19. And before I read, just a quick word of prayer, if you wouldn't mind, bowing this with me. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we would be remiss to go forward without acknowledging you, asking you to touch the hearts of your people, and to bring revelation where we cannot. Lord, you are the revealer of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You know what is in us, and need not that any man should testify about man to you, for all knowledge is in you, all understanding is in you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would anoint even now your word, make it come alive, make it plain, make it straight and clear, that we might do your will, hallelujah, and do your bidding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you so much. Again, Acts chapter 2. Verse 36 and verse 37. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, that is the people Peter was preaching to, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what Shall we do? Turn now to Acts chapter 19. And let's read verses 1 through 6 in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast of uh, to Ephesus, uh, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto him, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And as we were seven, and all the men were about twelve. Amen. We thank and praise God for the reading of his word. I like to use for a thought today, true believers do. True believers do. You may be seeing it. True believers do. Now what they do depends on what God has asked of them. But true believers always do. I struggled with how to title this because what the Lord really wanted me to do was to focus you on the actual encounter that Paul had with this group of believers. The key here is to recognize he came across a group of people who believed. There was no doubt about their belief. He calls them believers. And yet there was something more that they needed in their experience with Jesus Christ. Now in order to receive today's message in its fullness, uh, God would have us to receive this with a good understanding of the importance of seeing this passage 
through an apostolic lens. And I specifically note through that perspective because every perspective on scripture can lead to a slightly different understanding. And so I want to give it to you from an apostolic perspective. Now to be apostolic is to believe on and obey Jesus Christ based on what was preserved for us in scripture by his apostles. That's what it means to be apostolic, is to believe on Jesus Christ based on what was left to us in holy writ by those who were firsthand uh, uh, partakers of his teaching, okay? And I want to examine this with you from a scriptural basis, this statement of believing on Jesus Christ as was delivered to us by the apostles. And I'm going to invite you to the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John, I'm going to read to you certain excerpts from John chapter 17. We're not going to read the whole chapter. I'm just going to pick a few verses out for you just so that you understand it. And this passage of scripture here in John 17 is Jesus' prayer for his apostles just before he was crucified. So this is part of the Gethsemane type of experience that the Lord Jesus Christ had. And in this 17th chapter, he specifically turns his attention to those who he was leaving for the purpose of uh, delivering the gospel, presenting the gospel to the rest of the world. So I want to start off, if you would mind, reading verses just 4 through 6 uh, as the Lord began to share what he was praying about here in John chapter 17. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ came to do the will of the Father. Everything about Jesus Christ was about submission to the will of God. And we see this accentuated in the Garden of Gethsemane at that pivotal prayer when he prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup, the cup of suffering, the cup of crucifixion, pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. This is the testimony of all of the life of Jesus Christ. It was to teach us how to say those words. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. All right. And so he said, look, I've given them your word. I finished this work that you gave me to do. And in verse five, and now, O father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Before God ever said, let there be light. He knew he was going to be bringing salvation unto his people. Verse number six, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. He made it clear to us that he came to deliver the name upon which all people must be saved. If we were to read again in the book of Acts, and looking around verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 12, it would tell us that neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given unto heaven among men whereby we must be saved. That name is Jesus Christ. And so he says, I have delivered unto them your name, and they have kept your word. They are the bastions now of making sure that your word continues to go forward. Because I'm about to leave here. I'm about to be crucified. But I'm going to work through these men to be a blessing unto all men. And jump down to verse number 9. Here the Lord says very clearly, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. I'm praying, oh Father, that you would keep these men. Because they have to bear this word. Everything that I've done, they've got to do now amongst all the world. Jesus told his disciples, greater works shall you do, because I go to the Father. Do you not know that Jesus' desire for us is to do more than to come to church on a Sunday and sit on the chairs and praise his name and glorify him? That's all good, but there's work to be done out there. And the Lord wants us doing that work 
Hallelujah in his holy and precious name. And so he says, I'm praying not for the world. I'm not asking for the good of the world. Hallelujah. The world has got a path it's going to go down. And the path the world is going to go down is not a good one. The Bible tells us in the last days, perilous times shall come and that the world itself is going to be plunged into chaos. But in the midst of the chaos, God is able to keep his own people free from the sin and free from the chaos of this world. He preserves those who love him and he gives them power not to be caught up in the things of this world and swallowed up by the traditions of this world, but to be raised above all that is in this world. Hallelujah! So that we can live above it. How many are glad that Jesus has lifted you up? So song says he lifted me up out of the deep miry clay. He planted my feet on a rock to stay. He put a song in my soul today. A song of his praises. Hallelujah. God will always uphold his people. The world may be going down, but Jesus will always lift up his people. And so he said, I'm not praying for the world, but I'm praying for my disciples. I'm praying for my apostles, for they belong to you, and you've given them unto me. Jump down to verse uh, number 12. And he says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. See how much importance there is on the name? How Jesus focuses on the name? The name isn't God. God is not a name. Father is not a name. Those are titles. But he said, I've kept them in your name according to the authority and the power that you've given unto me. We know the scripture the Bible says in the last days. To Jesus, every knee shall bow at his name now. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. It glorifies God when you exalt the precious name of Jesus Christ. So it says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. We know who the son of perdition was, right? This was Judas. And so I'm just pointing out who God, who Jesus Christ is praying for. It's his apostles. And he even points out Judas is lost. He's the son of perdition. But the rest of the 11 plus the one that they're going to add later. Those are the ones that are praying for. Jump to verse number 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. The Lord has never wanted us to go away and hide in a monastery like a monk. Hallelujah. Away from the world afraid that if we're in the world, it's going to defile us. The world cannot defile a child of God. For the Bible says, I I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them while they're in the world. Hallelujah. I'm glad I don't have to get out of this world to be saved. I just have to put my trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, this is a strong prayer. Jesus Christ is praying for his disciples. They're going to be out in this nasty, filthy world. But I'm praying, hallelujah, Father, keep them in the world so they can be strong and witnesses of you. Just like I was in the world but wasn't of the world, they're going to be in the world, but they're not of the world. Jump to verse number 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. I see it. Jesus said, just as I was here and you sent me to preach, now I'm going to send them to preach. They're the ones who are going to let the rest of the world know that I'm still alive. I'm not going to physically appear to anybody else until my second coming. But I'm going to put a word in those who know me so they can preach and teach and talk. 
talk about me with the same conviction as if they saw me physically standing with them. And that's what I'm going to do here for my apostles. I want you to know that God has sent his apostles to preach the word of God to us that we might believe. Look at verse number 20. Neither pray I for these alone. This is important now. Yeah. Remember, he's been praying up to this point about his apostles, specifically yeah. about them doing his will, yeah. continuing to do the work that he started. He says, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. We believe on Jesus Christ, right. not because we physically heard him speak. We believe because of the word, the scriptures that have been left that tells us what Jesus did, that yeah, tells us yeah, yeah, yeah. what Jesus said, that yeah, tells us yeah. about the miracles he did. And because we believe the word, therefore we become the children of God hallelujah. because believers do. When you believe, hallelujah, this testimony of scripture, something on the inside of you is going to move. Just like those people on the day of Pentecost from Acts chapter 2, the first person's passage we read, upon hearing that they were instruments of crucifying the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, when they realized the wickedness that they had done, when they realized the sin that they were in and their hearts were pricked. They repented of what they had done. They were got me sorrowful for the role that they had played in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. When they realized this, they said to Peter and the apostles, it said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Believers, true believers do. True belief will always stir you to do. It will stir you to action. Oh, verse, hallelujah, number 20, makes it clear that our faith and our belief, Jesus prayed for us, those that will believe on him through the word of the apostles. Even us sitting in this place or standing in this temple right now, was because Jesus prayed that when we hear these words out of this sacred book, that we would believe it and that belief would translate into us doing something. This is what it means to be apostolic and to hear the words of God and to do what the words of God have said. Now turn with me back to Acts chapter 2 and let me put the finishing touch on this concept of apostolicism. Again, I want you to understand it so you can truly get what Acts chapter 19 was all about. We believe on God because of the word that has been left. It is the word that tells us what it is God desires. It's not how I feel. It's not how I think. It's not a seminary or a theology concocted by some theologian who doesn't even believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. That's what you find in most of these seminaries today. They don't say this is the word of God. They say the Bible contains the word of God. In other words, there's pieces of it that are from God, but there's pieces that are not from God. That's heresy. The Bible says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is good for reproof and for doctrine and for instruction in righteousness. That's Bible. And so those that are apostolic base their whole experiences on scripture. So look at Acts chapter 2. We read verses 36 and 37. So we're not going to read those again. That's where they said, men and brethren, what must we do? So pick it up at verse number 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. This is the first sermon ever preached. Nobody had preached a sermon since Jesus had resurrected until now. The 
very first sermon preached, uh, this is what was said. Uh, it wasn't said just believe in your heart uh, and you're saying uh, believers, true believers, want to do something. Uh, oh, when they really believe. Uh, Being a brethren, what must we do? Uh, Peter said, repent again. Uh, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ uh, uh, for the remission of your sins. Uh, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, verse 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, that's us, afar off meant non-Jews, to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This promise is to everybody. It wasn't just for the first century church. It wasn't just something God did back then. God does the same thing today. Forever, oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. God does not change. Jesus Christ is the same, the Bible says, yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He is the same. And so he goes on and to let them know. Verse 40, and with many other words. Did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this unto what generation? We don't get the rest of the sermon, but what we are told is that there was more yes. that was shared about what you must do. Hallelujah. Besides the repenting, the being baptized, and the receiving of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse number 41. Remember, true believers do. Then, they that gladly received the word were baptized. When they heard what they must do, they went about and did it. Yeah. Because they believe. Believers do. True believers do. They don't just intellectually ascend to some uh, understanding. What comes, the revelation comes uh, to give them power to actually do something. Oh, my Lord. And the Bible says, in the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 people. 3,000 souls were added on that day. There was verse 42 that I really brought you here to read. But I wanted you to see the context. Because context matters. I'm not just pulling the scripture out of its context. I'm letting you know what it actually says here. That's just Brother Grant. He's just a person. He's going to come in and sit down like you're doing. Don't be caught up on him. He's just entering into the chapel. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly. How? In the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. That's what it means to be apostolic. To continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Doctrine. Yeah. Uh, hallelujah. And in breaking of bread and prayer. So those who believe in Christ will follow what it is that he left. And what he left, he left us through his apostles. Yeah. There's no way to know what Jesus wants from you yeah. if he's not in the book. I don't care what your preacher says, how good his words may sound. If he can't find it in the book, I'd be a little concerned about that. Right, right, right. Hallelujah, because the apostles' doctrine is what the New Testament is. Because the whole New Testament was penned by the apostles. Jesus didn't write one of those words physically. He wrote them by the Spirit. They wrote what he gave them to write. But they were the penmen of it. They are the ones who wrote the New Testament. Right. It might as well be called the Apostles' Testament. Mm. This is what true apostolicism is. It's not a denomination. It is a way of living. It is a way of being. And I'm excited about it. It's a way of existing that is in the book. See, before the Lord revealed to me truth, I used to be like so many other people confused as to who God is and what God wanted. Because there's this doctrine over there and that doctrine 
watching over there. I can quote them, but I don't want to do that to you right now. I really just want to focus on what God let me see. He said, Joe, that's the way he talks to me. Don't worry about what everybody else is saying. Don't worry about who is right. Worry about what is right. Yeah. And what is right is my word. Forever again, my word is settled. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way. And I was a young man back then, 21 years old. I ain't that young anymore in body, but I'm young in the spirit. Woo! I still got it. Hallelujah. Because the Holy Ghost yeah. gives you youth. He says, I renew you. Yeah. I'll set you up on wings as yeah. eagles. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so the Lord said, don't worry about who. Get into what? Yeah. Get into your word. Yeah. I came across an image this week. It was of a little bitty baby. I want you to see the cutest little baby you've ever seen. And this little bitty baby was curled up with his or her head resting on the Bible. And the caption was resting in the word of God. And isn't that the way we should be as people? Shouldn't we love this word of God? Yeah. If it were possible, you should go to sleep yeah. with the word. Yeah. And David said, I'm going to meditate on your word yeah. day and night. Yeah. They're going to be my delight. Do you delight in the word? See, this is why we're here. We bring our Bibles to church because yeah. we love it. It's what we rest on. Yeah. It's where we put our confidence. And so this is what the Lord was telling them and what Peter was telling them when he preached to them, letting them know, hallelujah, that they were apostolic now. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Yeah. Now, I hope it's self-evident to you that from these passages in John, and this passage in Acts that you can see that the truth of the word is passed to us today by way of the apostles. This is the primary purpose for the New Testament. It is to reveal Christ, the Messiah that was foretold in the Old Testament right, right. in the same gospel of John chapter 5 verse 39 the Lord said to the Pharisees and the scribes search the scriptures search the Old Testament because there was no New Testament at that time search the Old Testament for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me look for it look at it look at yourself go look at John the five thirty. Now go look at it. So you can see I'm not saying this is not the doctrine of Joe Black. This is the doctrine of Jesus Christ given to his apostles. Search the word. Because in the word you won't find anything else but me, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So just as the Old Testament foretold the Messiah, the New Testament proclaims the authenticity of that Messiah being Jesus Christ. Together, we have the whole Bible. Oh, Lord. And the Bible tells us that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the New Testament and the Old Testament, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. That's Ephesians 4.20. You can go look at it at your chance uh, when you have a chance. We're built upon the foundation of the word. Oh, preacher, why are you belaboring this? Because true believers do. And what they do is not based off what they feel. It's not based off what they think. It's not based off what mom said, or dad said, or grand poobah said, or grandmother said. It's based off of what the word says. Yeah. That's what a true believer is going to do. So, the New Testament are the writings of the apostles. Now, do you not know this New Testament can be divided into four categories? Category one, the Gospels. The Gospels are biographies about Jesus Christ. They're specific 
prophetically to talk about the life of Jesus Christ. That's what they're for now, to talk about his life. They're not there to explain theology. Yes. They're there to say this is what Jesus Christ right, did. Right. That's all they do yes. is say what he did. They don't explain yes. theology in the Gospels. Right. There's one book called Acts. It's the only book of history in the New Testament. The only one that chronicles what the apostles did based on what the Gospels said. Hallelujah. The Acts said, what did they do? Yes. Not what they thought, yes. what they did right. based on what the Lord had said. Then you have the letters, the majority of the New Testament. You have the general letters. Those would be those written by men to no one in particular, like James and Jude and 1 John and 3 John and 1 and 2 Peter. These are general letters. Then you have letters to the churches, like to Ephesus and to, uh, to Thessalonica and to Philippi. And those are letters written to churches uh, to address issues or concerns with churches. Uh, again, they're written to churches, to people who were already saved. Uh, wasn't trying to explain salvation. It was trying to help them understand the basis of their faith. Uh, hallelujah. The last category in the New Testament uh, is the book of prophecy. Uh, the book of the revelations of John uh, which are foretelling uh, the end time. So you have four categories in the New Testament. Again, you have the Gospels. You have the one book of history. You have the letters written to the churches and the general letters. And you have the one book of Revelation. So of all those 27 books, only one book talks about what they literally did. That's the book of Acts. Acts of the Apostles. To give you the full name, it's apostolic. Amen. It is with this veil, or with this lens, that I want you to understand that everyone who is apostolic builds their life upon scripture. Apostolics now validate the authenticity of their faith through personal experiences that harmonize with the book of Acts and with the rest of the books of the Bible. You can't say that you're apostolic, but your experiences sound nothing like what's in scripture. Amen. We must be built upon the foundation of the apostles yes. and the prophets. Yes. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, the centerpiece yes. of our building. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yes. I'm belaboring the point. So we can really now turn our attention back to Acts chapter 19. Oh my Lord. For this is a passage of scripture that the Lord was weighing on my heart saying, I want you to talk to my people about this beautiful passage of scripture. I want them to see for themselves the favor that I have upon you. Everybody here is blessed and highly favored. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're blessed and highly favored. You're highly favored because you're sitting where you can hear the unadulterated word of God. I'm not preaching to you what I think or feel. I'm preaching to you what thus saith the word of God. So in this 19th chapter, the book of Acts, we see recorded the backdrop is Paul is having an encounter with a group of believers when he entered the city of Ephesus. That's another one of those cities that a Bible uh, book is written to. The book of Ephesus, right? Same people, but earlier on in their history with the truth. Paul encounters these disciples, which he called, he knew were believers. Because his first question to them, when he saw them, was the one that let you know that he knew that there were believers. And I think you'll be able to stay with me. 
me and realize this is true too. Because when he saw them, these disciples, his question was, have you received the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit since you believe? That means after you believe. That means you don't receive the Holy Ghost just because you believe. Now, if he wouldn't have said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? I see that you believe. Oh, how do I know that? Just like you know today, when you meet people who believe in Christ, these are people where their understanding of God and religiosity feels authentic. It feels real. They're not out there trying to put the themselves up to be somebody great. They're not acting like they know everything. They're just moving in what they know. And they're believing in what they know with all their heart. Oh, Jesus. And this is what the situation was with a palace who was talked about in the chapter preceding this chapter. In fact, it was the palace that witnessed to the saints at Ephesus. They knew what a palace had told them while well, Paulus didn't know all the truth. All of Paulus knew according to the testimony in Acts chapter 17 was the baptism of John. That's all he knew. He didn't know about the Holy Ghost. He didn't know about baptism in Jesus' name. But what he knew he shared faith in the Messiah. And so these people were clean living people how do I know they're clean living? Because when John the Baptist was preaching, he said, repent and bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. In other words, you got to change. You can't come to God and stay the same way yeah. you used to be oh father help me I'm being oh my lord and father, just filled up with the word of God for you yeah. when you come to Christ something you has to change yeah. you can't be in the presence of a holy God yeah. and not be transformed yeah. oh that's what wow. Jesus comes to do yeah. is to make you different yeah. and to make you new. Right. This is what he does. Yeah. And so these believers, they were living the best they knew, yeah. doing what they had heard right. sincerely, yeah. not with a bunch of tradition, uh -huh. and not with a bunch of pop. Yeah. And Paul could see this. Yeah. What else could Paul see? Their behavior was different. Yeah. I believe just from the account yeah. that the people didn't have a bad attitude. Yeah. They weren't trying to act like they knew everything. Yeah. Paul was talking to him, yeah. and as he talked, yeah. he could tell something was off. Yeah. And he just asked a question. Yeah. Then he said, Who are you yeah. to come tell me what I believe and don't believe? Yeah. Hallelujah. They didn't get an attitude, yeah. they just listened. Yeah. Oh, true believers yeah. are listening. So, what can I do to show God? I'm all in. Yeah. I'm holding back nothing. Uh -huh. How Paul could see this in these people. How else did Paul know they were different? It was the way they talked. See, true believers don't curse. True believers don't swear. True believers don't take the name of the Lord in vain. True believers don't use foul language, even if it's not a four-letter word. They don't talk in ways that make people feel dirty and nasty after they finish opening their mouths. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the ears of Edifying uh, that it may administer grace uh, unto the hearer. Uh, when a child of God speaks, uh, people should feel motivated. Uh, hallelujah to do uh, what Jesus Christ did. Uh, I'm talking about true believers now uh, and what they do. Paul uh, saw all that. Uh, he didn't condemn them uh, for where they were. Uh, he didn't call them off uh, backwards. Don't know what you're talking about. He just asked a question. Yeah. Have you received the Holy Ghost yes. since yes. I can tell you believers? Yes. They said, we haven't even heard uh -huh. about the Holy Ghost. Yes. Yes. We 
walking with God, but nobody talks about the Holy Ghost. How could, how could somebody from John tell them about the Holy Ghost when John didn't know about the Holy Ghost right. yeah. as an abiding spirit? Jesus said, it's expedient that I go away. And John didn't hear this because he was in prison or his head was already cut off. Right. It's expedient that I go away because if I go not away, the comforter will not come. Yeah. And the Bible tells us that the Lord gave the Holy Ghost after he was glorified. Mm. And so they didn't have this part of the revelation. They weren't heathens. Right. They weren't acting like, you know, wicked Gentiles. They just were believers who didn't have all the truth. That's all. And Paul didn't condemn them. He said, well, if you haven't heard about the Holy Ghost, how were you baptized? Mm. Now, if this isn't necessary, why is Paul going there? See, we have to understand something. That believing, our belief has to incorporate more than an intellectual ascent. Right. Our belief is to bring about salvation experience. Praise God. God wants you to have an encounter with him. Mm -hmm. An experience. Yeah. When you have an experience, you can have a testimony. A testimony is not something that God did for somebody else. It's what God did for you. Amen. This is what Jesus Christ always came to bring us encounters with him. And so Paul recognized the encounter they needed to have. They hadn't had yet. Notice I say the word yet. Because he wanted to say, look, in essence, your salvation is more than believing. You got to do something. Because Paul asked them again, how if you receive the Holy Ghost since you believe? Their response was, no, we haven't heard so much with the Holy Ghost. He then said, how are you baptized? This line of questioning would not make any kind of sense if all you had to do was believe. Right. Because here's what Paul said after he asked them how they were baptized. He said, John preached Jesus. I'm paraphrasing. John preached Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. Believe on him. That's exactly what he said. Mm. Well, not exactly. It's perfect. <laughs> That's the essence of what he said. <clears throat> okay. John believed in Jesus. Yes. Jesus. John preached the Messiah, who was Jesus Christ, so believe on Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, yep, they, they got that. And if it was belief alone, we could just stop right there. Right. But it doesn't stop there. It didn't end there. Paul obviously went on to share more, just like we read in the book of Acts after Peter preached yeah. those three things. And it says, with many other words, yeah. we don't hear the words, yeah. but the Bible tells us that with many other words shared, right. that is clear here too. Because <clears throat> after they heard this, the question is what they hear. Mm -hmm. After they heard this, then they were baptized. Well, yeah. We don't read anywhere where, where, where Paul specifically preached that you need to be baptized. Right, that's true. He just said, yeah. how were you baptized? Uh -huh. You're supposed to believe on Christ. Uh -huh. And they said after they heard this, whatever else he said, they were baptized in the name right. of the Lord Jesus right. Christ. Amen. Amen. This is what I say to understand this. You got to understand it through an apostolic lens. Paul didn't rely on just what they felt. Right. He didn't rely on how they looked. He relied on what scripture says. Right. What we know to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And it's the gospel right. that he was looking for validation yeah. Yeah. in their lives because true believers do. Amen. Amen. And so he sees them in their condition. And he says, you need to be baptized. And they obviously heard that. Because when they heard it, the scripture says, then they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just like we need to. And then they went on to say that they received the Holy Ghost. Yeah. The Spirit of God. How do we know they received it? Because it says they speak with tongues yeah. as the Spirit of God gave right, them utterance, right. just like the day of Pentecost. Yeah. Now, now, if this wasn't necessary, why did God do it? Mm. It was only 12 people. Mm. Holy, Pentecost had 30, like 3,000 plus. Yes. This is 12 people. But the message to the 12 Yes. It's the same message to the 3,000. Yes. It's the same message to the one. Amen. Repent. Amen. And be baptized in the 
name of Jesus Christ Amen. for the removal of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the promise of the Father. Right, right. Believers want to do. Amen. When you believe, your belief, you know what the Bible tells us? Yeah. That baptism is the answer of a good conscience towards God. I believe 1 Peter chapter 2, 24, something like that. It's how you answer, show that you have a good conscience towards God when you are baptized in his name. Amen. Hallelujah. Because your conscience wants to do something. Right. When you love somebody, mm. when you really love somebody, yeah. I mean, when that love wells up in you, first time you saw your mate, First time I saw my lovely wife, I saw her sitting on a wall at Cornell University with her mother. It's, it's indelibly inscribed in my head. I saw my lovely wife. When I saw her, I wanted to do something. I wanted to find her. And I'll tell you the story another time. But God led her back to me. Out of all 17,000 people on that campus. Yeah. God led us back together. But here's the point. When you really feel love, don't you want to do something? Yeah. If you really love someone, it's just call it, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, their birthday. Mm. You really love them. What right. do you, what, right. you don't just say, oh, I love you. Right. You want to do something. Right. Love motivates you to want to do. God so loved the world yeah. that he came. Right. Love is always an action. When you love someone, you will do. The purpose for our faith is always to motivate us to act. And what are we seeking when we're acting? We're seeking oneness with Christ. And oneness with Christ occurs when we're baptized in his name and filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. True faith will always lead us to obedience. And obedience is always in action. Amen. Oh, my Lord. Hallelujah. I need you to hear what the scripture says about belief in the gospel. It's written in the book of Thessalonians. That God is going to come in one day. And when he's coming, he's going to have vengeance on all of those that don't believe. And the Bible says that don't obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. That means you can obey the gospel. Well, what's the gospel? It's the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. That's the good news. Jesus died, was buried, rose again, and ascended on high. How do you obey that? By you dying. How do you die? You repent. How do you get buried? In water by baptism. Yes. How do you rise up? That's called receiving the Holy Ghost. Yes. How do you ascend into heaven? That's called rapture. Yes. You can obey the gospel yes. by doing, yes. putting into practice what Jesus Christ yes. wants you to do. Because when you obey God, it gives God the opportunity now to bless you. How many want to be blessed of Jesus Christ? How many want to feel the power of God? Surging inside of them. Yeah. How many want the anointing yeah. to be so thick on you? Yeah. To where sometimes you don't know what to do with yourself. Yeah. Ow! I don't know about you, but sometimes I begin praising God. Yeah. And I don't quite have the tools to get it all out. Yeah. The way it's burning yeah. on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes I just have to shake my hands. Yeah. Sometimes I just gotta shuffle my feet. Oh. Ah! Yeah. To give release yeah. to what God, oh my Lord, yeah. is doing. Yeah. And some of you, you want to let go, yeah. but you're too self conscious. Yeah. You're too worried about how do I look? Yeah. How do I sound? Yeah. Oh, but how many people yeah. don't care about what other people say about them? Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. I'm going to praise God because yeah. I know. That since I believe, yeah. I receive yeah. the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And it gives me 
joy. Yes. Joy. Yes. Joy. Yes. joy. Yes. Jesus said, I'll give you a well a living water spread up yes. into everlasting life. Yes. I'll put within you yes. something that'll stir you. Yes. You may not be feeling the absolute best. Yes. You may have just had surgery. Yes. And you might need to be careful yes. about how much you move. Yes. But you can still yes. wave your hand. Yes. You can still pat your foot. Yes. You can still go out <laughs> if it hits you that way. Yes. It's okay. Yes. It's okay. Yes. It's okay. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Yes. It's okay. It's okay. Because true believers yes. do. Yes. True believers don't come and sit in the house of prayer yes. and act like you're here for some theological debate, yes. some theological discussion. I'm not here for theology. I'm here for experience. Yes. Woo! Yes. I'm here because yes. at some point I want to feel that anointing. Yes. Whoa! Yes. It gets me happy. It makes me move like I'm moving now. That's what I live for. Yes. This is my breath. This is my strength. Yes. The joy yes. of the Lord yes. is your strength. Yes. The Bible says, don't be sorry. Yes. And don't be yes. sad. Yes. Ah! Yes. We got a song. Why should I feel discouraged? Why? Should the shadows come? That's a nice song. Yeah. I probably would. But I like singing it slow. Because yeah. it sounds like you said. Yeah. I sing because I'm happy. <laughs> well, I've never been happy like that. But I know. When I get joy, yeah, yeah. I know a song that says, I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. Oh, you don't know like I know what he's done for me. No, you don't know like I know what he's done for me. I get joy. I get joy. I get joy. I did. See, y'all don't know that song. Oh, my Lord. Because we'd be rocking. Rocking the place. Hallelujah. One day. Yeah. Stick with me. Yeah. Oh. Glory to you, Stick with me. One day you're going to know that song. Yeah. And when you sing that song with me, mm -hmm. you're going you gonna to end up on the floor. You might just roll around. Why are you mean, preacher? I ain't gonna get on the floor and roll around. You don't know what you're gonna do when the Holy Ghost hits you. Exactly. That's just a testimony. You never, you never felt this. Because yeah. if you felt this the way I'm talking about, sometimes you don't have any choice. You just gotta go with what He does, and you don't mind letting the Lord Jesus Christ use you. Amen. Believers, true believers, do. They do. What is written in the word. That means a preacher must preach what is in the word. Amen. And this is why the Lord told me, preach this word. Hallelujah. Because I want my people to know they can trust my word. You can't trust people. Ah, the Bible says don't put your hope in people, your yeah. trust in people. Yeah. Ah, they're going to fail you every time. Yeah. But put your trust in God. Yeah. Put your trust in that word. Ah, because you can always say, Lord, yeah. your word said this. Yeah. And that's what I did. God is never going to be upset with you for obeying his word. But I can guarantee you, he'll say, depart from me, you work of iniquity. Yeah. I never knew you. No, no, no. These are people who were doing miracles. They said, we're casting out demons in your name. We're healing the sick in your name. We're visiting, in some cases, other people. And we're doing a, mighty, a lot of mighty, wonderful works in your name. And Jesus said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. That is scary to me. Amen. 
Because that tells me you can be doing the right things without revelation. Amen. Just like the saints in Ephesus. Yeah. The right stuff, but the understanding wasn't fully opened. And so we here we are today. Every one of us in a position where we can be true believers. Some of us have been baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. That's wonderful. But do you not know there are other things God wants you to do? Amen. And are you willing to say, yes, Lord, use me however you will? Amen. Some of us haven't been baptized in Jesus' name, and today you have that opportunity to do that. When that opportunity comes, don't just dismiss it. Say, yes, Lord. Amen. If you know you haven't been baptized in Jesus' name, I mean, you don't... You don't have to do it today. If you want to be baptized, I'll spend some time with you. We'll just go right through the scriptures. We'll let scripture talk. I'm not afraid of letting the scriptures talk for you. I don't need to say anything. Scriptures bear witness of themselves. Amen. The question is, are we true believers? Amen. Because true believers do. Amen. It's just in you to do. It's not in you to argue. I'm not saying you may not understand. I didn't always believe what I believe today when I first came to the Lord. I did not. First time somebody told me about this, I told them they were crazy. Mm. I said, y'all crazy. <laughs> you can't tell me that somebody has to be baptized in Jesus' name to make it in heaven. Because I began to think about all the situations, all the people I knew right. who weren't baptized that way, who I said, well, they have to make it. Right. Until I read the scriptures, and the scripture says, save yourself from this untoward generation. Right. Amen. And I read the scripture like the one I read to you before. A lot of people doing stuff in my name, and God said, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I was like, whoa, what are you trying to say, Lord? This is why the Bible says, in the day you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. Right, right. That's why it says that. Amen. Because we have a choice. God will never force his way into our existence. We must let him in. Amen. We must freely give over to him. I'm going to stop here. I have a part two. I'm not going to preach it today, but another time. Part two is simple belief. Mm -hmm. That's part two God gave me this morning. Simple belief. Faith is simple. Belief is simple. It's our intellect that complicates matters. Mm -hmm. Come to Jesus.